and I Okay, I think we are live here on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. I am Lindsay the Frugal Crafter along with Sarah. Hi. And we actually have Chewy in the studio here today. Yes. So if you hear a jingle jangle or a clickety clack of the dog paws, she is here visiting and exploring. So uh, that's always fun. It's been a while since she's been here. No, she was here last week. She no, was? No, she wasn't. I'm sorry. She was at daycare. Okay. But I'm she like... was here the week before. Oh, she must have been real quiet because she I, was. Or I was too preoccupied with random technical issues, which hopefully, fingers crossed, everybody that we don't have today. Um, so, as always, if you have any questions for me as we're going along, uh, type it right into the chat on the YouTube watch page. Type the word question in all caps, and um, either one of the moderators will help you, or Sarah will relay the question to me, and I can answer it live here. Um, we're going to paint some misty mountains and I have all of the supplies uh, listed in the video description and uh, some more photos on my blog if you want to see uh, a better photo of the um, of the finished practice piece. Now this practice piece I did on a student grade paper. This is Aquafine by Dale Rowney. It is a wood pulp paper and I knew that it was going to be cha more challenging to paint on this type of paper so I wanted to do my practice one on this paper so as we go along on the cotton paper um, I can kind of um, kind of tell you what to do if you're on the wood paper if you're experiencing any um, any frustrations but if you have cotton paper it would be a great time to to use it um, well how's the chat going today good everyone can see and hear us it's, yep oh awesome <laughs> uh, also if you are local to Maine I wanted to let you know that I will be at the Briar Patch bookstore in downtown Bangor this afternoon from four to six signing copies of Yay! Yay! Uh, the new book I illustrated, Sea Glass in the Lighthouse. The book is written by Kelly Brooks Bay, who wrote the book, The Rainbow Pants, which I also illustrated. Um, this book will be available on Amazon next week, but the actual first launch is today. So if you want to, um, you know, get a copy of the book signed, then you can see us there. So that'll be from four to six tonight in downtown Bangor. And it's a, uh, it was a lot of fun to work on this book and, uh, and there's Kelly, there's Kelly. These pictures are actually from the first book, so like we look way young there. So like, <laughs> I have an age you, today. You guys have an age today, <laughs> day. In fact, I just think you're reverse aging. Yes, yes, reverse aging. I like that. Well, the colors we're going to use, and excuse my swatch, I did it on a sketchbook page because that's what I had handy. Uh, we've got permanent alizarin crimson, transparent brown, but you can use um, burnt sienna if you don't have that, sap green, uh, cerulean blue, um, indigo, which you could use Prussian blue if you don't have indigo, and dioxazine purple. Um, these colors are from the core line of watercolors by Golden. Uh, you can use whatever brand you have, but I had a few people ask me about these recently and I thought I would use them in a demo. And um, there are several introductory sets out there for core. There are three sets of six, there's one set of 12 and one set of 24, and there are some duplications um, between the sets. So you want to look at them, uh, read the descriptions if you're going to buy multiple sets to make sure that you don't get a bunch of duplications um but uh but i'm really happy with the paints i've been using them for a couple of years and um i thought i would use them today and i'm actually using the tin that they came in for my mixing area and i just put them in little half pans so um so i think that's it do anything else i forgot to mention uh yep yeah, uh, questions type the word question in all caps the and the actual question question in regular regular punctuation and caps and stuff uh Oh, that's right, because YouTube will boot you out if they see you screaming in all caps. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Valerie's covering it in words. Awesome. Great. Great. Oh, okay, so I'm just, I was going to work on the Langton Prestige paper, but I didn't have any torn down, and I didn't want to disturb the dust bunnies under my bed by, uh, by digging around for the full <laughs> sheets of that. So I'm working on my arches block, but any cotton paper would be preferred, but use whatever you have if you don't have it. We're going to start by wetting our paper. So... Uh, if you're working on cotton paper, you probably find just to wet it uh, really well one time. If you're working on wood pulp paper, you want to wet it, let it soak in, and wet it again. Because I do notice that the wood pulp paper dries quicker and it also dries unevenly. And that's not even a bad thing. You could do that if you're working on cotton paper too. You want a kind of a satin sheen. You don't want puddles for this technique. You just want it to kind of soak in a little bit and just be um, kind of satiny. So you can tip it to make sure you've, you know, inked it well. Uh, wet it well and if you do have any puddles then or you feel like you've got too much water what you can do is blot your brush on a paper towel or a rag get as much excess water out as you can and then go over it and then you'll end up sopping up any extra water 
and uh, it'll just make it a little bit easier to do this technique. So you, you, it's very important to have a semi-gloss or satin finish on your paper with the water. Too puddly is not gonna work, too dry is not gonna work. So the wetness of the paper is the, is the key to this project. Uh, Lisa Lund, if we can't come to Maine but want a signed copy, is there a way to get one? Yes, I talked to Kelly about that. Uh, she's going to have um, signed copies on her website, Kelly uh, kellybrooksbay.com, and I will link to that as soon as they are up. Um, I did link to her website the other day, but, uh, but I'll link again when they're up so people can get those. We're going to start off with Cerulean Blue, and if you don't have Cerulean, it's totally fine to use Cerulean Blue Hue. This is... Um, Cerulean Blue Chromium, PB36, if you've got the pigment number handy. And we're going to start with that. I'm going to add a little bit of indigo to that just to kind of um, dull the color down a little bit. And we're going to start that up at the top of our paper. I'll bring it down the edge a little bit. Now I'm going to add some water to my mix here, but I don't want to get my, my paint really wet. So I'm going to blot my brush off and then reload into that new color so that I don't end up just making back runs and blooms. Uh, back runs and blooms are more likely to happen on your wood paper because of the, uh, the fact that it tends to dry uneven, a little bit less evenly. And another thing you can do if you're having an issue with streaks, you can tap it. You can do things like that to help pull the color around. Oh, that seems chewy. <laughs> and dog sneeze. Okay. And if the paper is all still uniformly wet, you can play around with that sky. You can move the color around a little bit. We just kind of want a real soft, hazy color here. You can even go over it with the damp brush there to really make sure it's nice and smooth. There we go. So nice ombre blend there. And now I'm going to switch to a smaller brush because I do not want to have so much pigment in here. I'm going to go with our indigo. And these are kind of muted. They're, these are going to be the further away trees that are kind of hidden in the fog. And what we're going to do is kind of tap, tap your brush and see how much it spreads. That's spreading a lot. So I'm going to dry my brush off with the uh, paper towel. Then I'm going to go back in and get some color because that's spreading more than I want. And try it again. That's a little bit better. So this lesson is really gonna teach you how to deal with the amount of um, wetness on your paper and wetness on your brush. So what you don't wanna do is panic when if you get if your color spreads too much because that is that's that's gonna make you um, make some rash decisions and you've got time. Okay, your paper's all wet, you've got time. You do not have to like freak out and make a rash decision about anything here. And I'm going to keep working until I'm out of paint. Because that will give us the look of like, um, kind of, you know, billows of mist kind of coming in and out because it's never uniform. It's, it's more patchy. And as I start to run out, I'm going to hit the ends, the bottoms of my tree line and just kind of spread that down a little bit. So they kind of disappear into the fog. If you're watching the replay, um, feel free to pause whenever you need to. And you will feel, you may feel like you're racing against a clock on a wood paper because things are gonna dry and you might get puddles. So um, be kind to yourself if you're working on wood paper. Be kind to yourself anyway, but especially if you're working on wood paper and you're getting a little frustrated. I'm gonna reload again, and I'm gonna do a little group of trees over here. I'm first going to touch the paper. Okay, I don't want too much spread. That looks good. Uh, Becky McCleary, thoughts on mop brushes and what application would you use them for in watercolor? To tell you the truth, I don't use mop brushes much in watercolor. Um, I tend to use them more like for softening uh, in oil painting, like to get rid of my brush strokes. Um, but, I mean, some people use them to wet the paper. I find that they tend to shed. Most mop brushes will have that tendency. I'm blotting off a little bit of the paint because I feel like it's a little bit too dark here. And because of the spread on the wet paper, I'm just doing little lines for the most part and letting them kind of fan out into tree shapes. If 
anybody is a big mop user and wants to pop into the chat and give her some suggestions, that would be great. Because I, I like pointed rounds myself. I rarely ever use a mop, which is like kind of a fluffy, big, round, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, almost like a makeup blush brush, kind, kind of. <coughs> We've me. got Joe and Grace and Alexandra and Dom. We've oh, got good, some good. of our regulars. So if they have an Eve. So we have a lot of our regulars that can help if they do. Wonderful. I'm going to drag this down a little bit more. I don't want to have everything kind of mirrored and matching. I want to have uh, some difference. That's a great thing if you're hanging out and you're chatting because um, you can kind of watch it through once and then decide if you want to paint it and then you'll kind of know what's coming next when you go to paint it. So watching it through before you actually paint it can be really handy and really helpful. So I want to just get rid of that little edge there, even though it would probably be covered up by something in front of it. So I'm cleaning my brush, taking out the extra moisture, and just brushing over that edge. Now I'm going to take those blues and add a little bit of sap green. So I'm adding a little bit more uh, indigo to my mixing well. And grabbing some green. Hopefully my furnace is not too loud. I think the microphone usually cancels it out, but... It's cold today. <laughs> I know. I don't like it. It's so it's, it's been warmer than average, and then we get hit with this. It's so it's so uh, unexpected. It's a shock to the system. It is. So like I like I started before. I did my uh, I first touched the paint down lower than where I wanted the the trees to end up because I want to know if there's going to be any spread and how much spread, and then I'm kind of bringing the trees up higher. Working, uh, I'm sorry if my hand is in the way. Um, I like to work on the tip of my brush because it just gives me better control, but I will uh, tip it back here for your benefit. But when you're doing it, I highly recommend you keep that brush straight up and down. Uh, you're just gonna have a much easier time controlling your paint that way. Some of this green I find to be a little bright, so what I'm going to do is grab a little of the transparent brown or burnt sienna, whichever you're using. I'm going to add that in there too. That's going to uh, kind of dull it down, make it a little bit less uh, bright. It'll warm it up a little bit too. And it's okay that these are going to be fuzzier because these are further away. So that's why we're doing this with all the paper wet and we're working from the top of the paper down. And I'm going to clean my brush off and kind of pulse and, and dry it. You don't want to just clean it and go in wet. You want to dry it and then I'm going to drag some of that color down. So think of the bottom of each grouping of trees as being just kind of like surrounded by mist and fog. And this is so far away from the viewer's eyes, you wouldn't really see the texture of the branches, so it's fine if it gets, if they mush together and they just get kind of soft. And then I'm going to go back in with that big round brush just because it's a little bit, um, a little bit larger and just soften the edge of the bottoms there. Flick that down. Just be careful not to introduce too much water. You can see how it wants to lift right there. I don't know. I think you can probably see that. It almost looks like little fingerprints. So I'm going to go back in and just kind of normalize the uh, water there just by brushing over it. Just don't panic. Things will smooth out as they as the uh, water settles. If you're working on the wood pulp paper, you can have a paper towel and you can blot some areas because you may need to go in there and help it um, dry up or stay wetter a little bit more because it's a little bit less predictable. So you can add a little more fog that way just by, just by blotting, especially on the wood, wood paper. 
All right, going in, I'm going to do that same color, a little bit more blue, so I still have that green in there. Not a lot of water on my brush because the paper is still pretty wet. I'll put a little tree in here. And it's just nice to kind of cluster them a little bit because they look a little bit more natural. Like maybe you've got a, like a little bump in the hill or in the mountain. My brush is really, really dry. You can kind of see it's not even like, like if I spread apart the bristles, they just stay like that. That that shows you how dry the brush is. The water's on the paper. And then I am gonna clean the brush, blow uh, it off. Bev Roberts, my sap green is by Windsor and Newton Professional Quality and it doesn't look real. Can you suggest another manufacturer's sap green? <clears throat> I love M. Graham sap green. I like that better than the core sap green, actually. M. Graham sap green is my favorite. Uh, and I like the Sennelier olive green. Uh, Windsor & Newton, if you have the olive green by Windsor & Newton, that one is much more like a customary sap green. Their regular sap green is really vivid. It's uh, much, it's it's unusual. It's not like any other sap green that uh, that I know of. So what I'm doing here is just um, softening up any of those, any of the edges, the bottom edges of the trees where the mist are, just so I don't have any hard edges. I want things to float into the mist. And I'm going to do a few more green ones over here. I'm going to have them a little bit lower. Now things get warmer as they get closer to us, so that means um, less blue and more other colors. They also get a little crisper, but um, I'm going to add a little bit of brown to that too. That brown's nice and warm. So I'm doing brown, green, and I probably still darken it a little bit of indigo because it, that's pretty bright compared to everything else we've been doing here. Let's see what that looks like. And I can feel here that my paper's starting to dry. Um, it's not giving me an issue yet, but if it does, I have a little spray bottle handy that I can uh, flick a little bit of water in with. Because I don't mind the tips of the trees being crisp as I get like down halfway down the paper. And I'm just going to bring this little stand of trees right off the edge. I'm going to tip this and spray that bottom and let that kind of float down. And something that's fun, when you do have a really wet passage, you can actually drip salt in if you want to give it kind of the feeling that maybe there's some snow kind of rolling in. Not that we really want to think about snow very much around here right now. It was snowing this morning when I woke up. Oh, was it? I was yeah. still in bed. I missed it. Yeah, it was. I was like, oh, it's always so magical if you don't have to go out into it. It's like, oh, that's pretty. It wasn't pretty scraping my windshield yesterday morning, though. I didn't care for that so much. And I'm going to drop in a little bit of, uh, I think I'm going to do a little bit of that brown. It's really a pretty brown, this transparent brown oxide. It's got a nice luminosity to it. It's a very non-muddy brown. And I'm going to put a little bit of that um, indigo in there too. I do find the core colors to be very clean um, and they, they flow a lot. Meaning like when you drop some onto a wet paper, they just kind of go whoosh. And I think it's because of the binder is Aquazol, and I think it's a little bit less viscous than gum Arabic. And I think that's why we get that effect with those paints. But um, 
They're a lot of fun. I I I bought the the six chroma set uh, first, and then I just I just like I knew those were my cup of tea, and I got some more after that. So if that if you feel like you've got some staining there, um, you can lift, you can blot, you can lift. But I really don't think I want to. I think I like what's happening there. I'm gonna go over here with some more of those very similar colors, but I do like to mix it out into my mixing well first, just so that I um, kind of know what I have before I go in there with it. That seems a little dark, so I'm gonna add a little bit of water. You just don't want your brush to be sopping wet, okay? So I'm blotting, like I'll blot the belly of the brush the, right next to the ferrule. That will suck out the extra water, but still leave my pigment in there for the most part. And I'm gonna go in here with some warmer trees. So if you look at this green that I'm painting, hopefully it shows up. Uh, hopefully you can see the difference in color. What's in behind is a much more bluer green. And what I'm putting in here is much more um, yellowy. And that yellowy is warmer, a warmer color. That's from the transparent brown. That's really sitting in as, as the yellow in our, in our mixing uh, colors here. That would really stand in for yellow. Um, and that, that warmth just makes it look a little bit closer to us. I might actually switch to a smaller brush because all my trees are starting to look the same. Actually, go with that one. I think. Did, was there a question? Well, it. I think I have the. Uh, you have videos on matting your watercolor paintings, right? Yes, I do. Okay, that's what I thought. In your archive. Yes. Just. Okay. Uh, I would search framing. Yes. Okay. That would I was pretty sure up. you did, but I wanted to double check before I told this person yet <laughs> that you had them because I don't want her to go in right, and start right. searching and not be able to find. So that's very frustrating. Need a little more water there. If you sometimes, if you switch brushes, um, if you get a less absorbent brush, it's going to behave complete. Well, it's definitely going to behave differently because it's not going to hold as much pigment, and you'll be wondering why isn't this one working? try to keep the edge, the bottom edge, if, if the paper's not really wet, I try to just make sure that that doesn't get a chance to soak into the paper. So I might go back and just kind of brush over it just to keep it, um, keep that paint active. And then I can do the spray bottle technique that I just did a second ago to let it fade out to nothing because I, I think that looks really, uh, really nice when you do that. Right now, a little bit on its with the brush first. And I think I'm actually gonna to switch to this bigger one just to give me, an, again, another little bit of a difference in size and color of my trees. But even, I mean, look, you can get a lot of detail even with that really big brush because it comes to a nice point. how many people are painting along I would think that would be difficult to paint right along and not be tempted to peek at what people are saying in the chat yeah that'd be too nosy that's why I can't have a camera uh, the, uh, the computer in front of me with a <laughs> chat open so like, what are they saying who's I'm, typing what I'm missing out I'm missing out on the fun and we're softening the bottom of that little stand of trees just with the brush because it's it's a small area. And I think I'll go 
back to a smaller brush. I think I'm going to stick with a mimic. So I grabbed one that wasn't a mimic and I found that switching between those textures were a little bit difficult. If you feel like you're getting way too much water and you can't control it, just go with a smaller brush. You're not going to be able to bring as much water in that way. I love painting a little group of trees right above a, an area where I have um, just wet it because then it just the colors just kind of float and do fun things when they hit the water, the wet paper. Don't worry about painting a perfect tree because your brain's going to fill in everything. Uh, Rolf de Koch? Coke? Sorry if I mispronounced that. I just bought my very first set of watercolor paints and would like to know what would be a sensible way to explore how to use the paint for the first time. I'm staring at the paper. Um, I would just play with it. That's the best way to learn, I think, is just to just have fun experimenting. Um, if you want, you could find some quick beginner tutorials online. I have a playlist of beginners if you like the way that I teach. Um, and you could just kind of start there and, um, and, you know, work through a couple of those beginner tutorials. And then once you feel confident, then maybe finding a reference photo or something else that you want to paint, uh, on your own. Now what I'm doing here is just wetting the bottom of the paper and evening out the tension of the uh, paper and also evening out the drying time. So I don't end up with like, uh, blooms and blossoms where I don't want them. Now, if you left it like this, it would just look like, whoa, there's all this fog rolling in. But we're going to um, actually dry this, and then we will, when we'll get that all to another even um, balanced uh, wetness, and then we can go in and add the uh, foreground trees. But if you want to keep playing with something, it's very important you keep the tension of the paper uh, and the water balanced so that you don't end up with a bunch of back runs. So I don't have any puddles and it seems like everything is drying pretty evenly. So I'm gonna dry this. If you have any questions while I'm drying this, it's a great time to ask them. This will take me a couple minutes to dry. And uh, then we'll we'll go in with some closer trees. So it's uh, doing, the, doing the mist is really a matter of um, not freaking out, taking your time, letting the paint do what it wants to do and just um, being patient. Do you have any other questions popping in? Not yet, no. I did a painting of misty trees um, up at camp the summer before last, and I really like how it came out, because every morning the mist would roll in over the lake and up into the mountains, and uh, and I left my sketchbook outside and it poured, <laughs> like, it just Ooh. totally ruined all of my pa all of my paintings that were in that sketchbook. Uh, Sherry Ten, is this a whoops? Is this a starter set of pour, or did you pick and choose tube color? I actually bought the six, the the three intro sets of six, um, back when they first came out, and they were like about twenty five dollars for the six set, which I thought was still a really good deal. Now they're down to like around twenty um, on Amazon, and that's I that's where all the colors that I had came from. But I couldn't find cerulean blue in anything other than the 24 set. So I think I might have gotten that one as a freebie because sometimes when you order supplies from like Jerry's Artorama or Blick or Cheap Joe's, they'll send you like a, a free tube of a brand new paint to kind of get you hooked. And um, and so, or, or they changed what was in some of the introductory sets. That could be it. I recommend if you have to pick one, I think the high chroma set is the best one to start with because it's really unique to, uh, to that line. And um it, it's not going to be very similar to other things that you probably have but um but yeah i was really happy i got that one first and then i swiftly ordered the other two sets after playing with that one and then i was thinking i should have got the set of 24 but then i see there are different colors there are there would be duplicates um they're not all of the all of the 
there, there's there's duplications in the sets other than those three six the sets of six so um so just read and read what they come with and figure out what's best for the way you like to paint okay so now we're going to be doing some foreground trees and um i'm going to start off with the green but i'm going to add it right to that puddle where i've been mixing so nothing the reason i keep mixing into the same dirty um uh, area here is because it's going to keep harmony because no, I'm not doing anything that's completely weird and new. Everything is kind of being mixed on something else. So, um, so it just helps kind of bring about a little bit of unity. Um, I am going to put a, some mid ground, mid, mid foreground trees here with that green. It's just mixed with the dirty stuff left in the, in the palette. But I can get a little more detailed here because um, uh, because they're closer to us. The, the further down we work on the paper, the closer to the viewer the subject is. And move them right there. And I can also make them go up a little bit higher. As long as I'm anchoring them down a little bit lower, they will come across to the viewer as being closer. And this guy is a little bit behind that guy, so I'm going to add in a little bit of blue. I think I'm going to go with this brighter blue, though. <clears throat> I have little magnets on the bottom of these pans to, uh, to stick them into my palette. I'm just going to drop that in there and let it kind of spread around on its own. Katrina Noel, do you have any tips on getting past artist block and feeling confident when you're painting again? <coughs> Boy, um, art, a lot of time artist block for me comes from overwhelm. Like there's so many things I want to do and I can't buckle down and do any of them. Um, I honestly, this sounds so strange, but I find that just like cleaning my studio and reorganizing and Sarah's nodding her head. So she must have a very similar experience. No, I do the same thing. Like I hadn't been, I hadn't touched my jewelry making stuff in a long time. So I just sat down one day and started going through my stuff mm -hmm. like you do and just reorganizing and I was like, oh, and now I've been making some jewelry stuff. So that kind of helped me get out of that slump. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, like, uh, if you don't have a lot of supplies um, to reorganize, if you go like, you know, especially if you're a friend that crafts as well and you just kind of go and wander around Joann's or AC Moore or Michael's or whatever you have for, um, for a store, then that just like you'll see stuff you might even see something like sometimes i'll see something that i have and i'll be like why didn't i use that that's great i have that already or you might you know you might pick up a 50 cent you know bead that all of a sudden now you know how to you know make something with the things you already have so that would be my pinterest is another good one yep yeah as long as you don't start comparing yourself to what they're doing because that can be a little harmful if you're like well gosh why should i bother I'm never going to be as good as them. As long as you don't get into that sort of way of thinking, I think it'll be fine. Quickly spritz the bottom there so that they kind of fade away. And I'm going to do some trees a couple over here, I think, in a very similar fashion. Oh, and I've got a puddle there, so I don't want to let that sit. I'm going to just kind of blot up that little puddle. So just when you're working on the wood pulp paper, you're going to find that you probably need to do a little bit more of the blotting and spraying or blotting and, and brushing water to just to um, keep things at a uniform con wetness or consistency. So I'm going to do it. Let's do another one right over here. I start skinny and then I'll like work it bigger as I go because I can always make my tree fatter, but I can't make it skinnier again. Uh, Jojo P, have you ever done a cafe or city sketch painting? If so, how does it differ from your nature ones? Um, I've done a city one and I did it in a pouring technique. So it's quite a bit different than my nature ones. I typically don't do architecture very much. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of painting architecture. It's not my, uh, I like organic shapes more than man-made shapes, but, um, but I have done a couple. Um, but I usually do them with some like kind of more of an abstract technique because I like to have I like to have more color or more movement or just something that's that's not so straight liney. 
my dad wanted me to be an architect and uh, it just didn't jive with my <laughs> my personality sorry dad <laughs> <laughs> I think he's okay with it and I'm just going to spritz that so I can make that kind of flood And it's funny how they get, like, in the woods, they get these really long trunks, and then they'll, like, a little burst of growth at the top. It's like they, all their, their uh, branches on the bottom get all starved. Adding a little bit of that uh, cerulean in there. Cerulean's a color I don't use very often, but I think it's kind of a softer color, so I think it works n nice for this. I remember my first set of watercolor paints had cerulean in it, but it was, like, a, a student set and it was so the cerulean was just really chalky and yucky and so i like i never really liked that color but then when you try a, a real cerulean as opposed to a cerulean hue well i think cerulean hue is just like a really a, a blue that has a lot of white in it it's it is a real pretty color and it has some a real softness to it but a richness as well whereas like a in my student grade set when i was a child the cerulean blue was just very chalky and blah Other thing I like about the spray bottle is that it keeps you from getting too controlled and then it looks more natural. I have this big coffee mug where my I clip my microphone to, so if you hear a weird noise when I go for a fresh paper towel, <laughs> when I wash like an apple or a fruit or something, I save the paper towels and I just stick them, I let them dry and then I stick them in that big mug because I'm like, well, they're fine for painting with. <laughs> You know, they just, had, they just had, like, apple germs and um, water on them, so they're fine. But for some reason, I don't want to wash another apple with a, with a brand of paper towel that has apple germs on them. Apple store germs. And we'll do another little stand of trees over here. Just kind of in, in behind a little bit more. And I'm pretty much just going to wet this area, then drop in a few other colors. Grab some of that green. And I will define a little bit, trying to keep my hand out of the way for you guys. Uh, just define some of the edges. And they're just going to morph out into the wet area that I put. I'm gonna do a smaller brush because if I tip my brush that much, it just gets so wide. But you can use, you know, use your straight up and down technique, your perpendicular brush technique, and, uh, and you can keep using an eight or a 12. But so I can keep my hand out of the way, I'm using a smaller brush and tipping it more. And if you only have small brushes, that's a way to get that thicker line is just tip your brush more. And I think I'm going to start adding in, let's see, maybe a little bit of purple into that. Now, the only color from this, and this is on sketchbook paper, so it doesn't look really that bright, but dioxazine purple is a very high chroma color. These colors are more muted, so when you add this color into your painting, you need to mix it with something or it's going to be like, hit you over the head bright. So I'm going in with some of the dioxazine in my dirty mixing area, adding some indigo to it. So I've almost got like an inky, inky uh, blue here. So it's all about balance. I feel like this painting is definitely like a uh, a lesson on patience and balance and almost meditation. As soon as I saw that reference photo last night, I was like, and it was like one of the first ones I saw. And I was like, that's what I want to paint. I want to do something misty. And I'm like, well, maybe it's too simple to be interesting, but I think sometimes if you're if you're working on such a simple thing that's just one you know you don't have that much to think about you just need to worry about capturing that one thing and not have so many different motifs um competing for attention we've got one thing we got one job mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so look for any hard edges that you shouldn't have like right there that's a little hard so Gonna clean off a brush, blot it, and just kind of brush over that. 
uh, Cindy Patton, your paper towel for blotting looks really wet and inky. Don't you worry about transferring color. Is a wet paper towel better than a dry one or does it matter? Um, yeah, once it gets wet, I just get another one. This one is really wet. Um, but if your paper towel is wetter than your paper, the water's going to go to the paper towel regardless of how inky it is. But um, when, if they're, if this is really wet in there, it's about the same as the paper, then the it won't suck up water or leave it it won't do anything and then if your paper towel is wetter than your paper the paper the water will, will want to go from the paper towel onto your paper so water's always going to want to travel to the drier of the two surfaces just like from your brush if you have a brush that's like sopping wet and your paper's a little bit damp that water the, the paint's going to go whoosh onto your paper if uh if your paper is um is super super dry and your brush is i mean if, if paper is super super wet and your brush is just a little bit um, a, like a little bit wet, just a little pigment, it's going to want to suck that water off your paper. So it's that's another thing about the, the kind of balance of the wetness there. Hope that makes sense. If, if not, just kind of practice painting on dry, damp, and wet paper and try practicing with a wet brush, a damp dr brush, and a dry brush, and you'll see what I mean about where the water wants to flow. Water only, water wants to travel where it's wet, but it wants to travel from the most most wet item to the lesser wet item. And in the last set of trees we're going to do, we're going to be getting into some more purples and crimsons and uh, kind of really bringing in those warm colors to, um, to kind of pull forward towards the viewer and add a little excitement and interest. Uh, the Pinecone Crafter, if you had to guess how many different brands of paint you work, do you work with, how often do you mix brands in a particular project? Um, you would, honestly, excuse me, I mix brands all the time. When I'm uh, teaching, I try to stick to one brand just because, um, just to make it a little bit less confusing. But yeah, I mean, a lot of, and a lot of brands are indistinguishable. You get a, a ultramarine blue, it's going to be very similar from like 25 different companies. So, um so i mix i mix all the time you know unless i just happen to have a tin that's got all those same colors together it really does not matter um and most artists will come up with a palette that has their favorite attributes from each brand like i love daniel smith's french ultramarine it's super granular and it's beautiful i like um you know certain colors from da vinci certain colors from sennelier certain colors from schminka uh you know so i think most artists are like that they'll just build what they what they like the best I'm going to start by adding water to my soupy, muddy mix here. And I think I'm going to go in, I'm going to start off with some indigo and some green as my base. And I'm going to be dripping um, other colors into this. So this is pretty juicy. Uh, so it's the most watery mix I've done so far. My paper is dry now. And I'm going to start, we're going to be doing a cluster of trees over here, okay, in this corner. And um, actually, I really want this brush because it's super, um, it holds a lot of paint. So I'm just going to tip my paper so you can see that. So my hand's not in the way because I do want to keep it perpendicular. So I don't have to keep stopping and reloading. So I'm going a little bit below where I want the top of the tree to end up because I just have so much paint on here. Uh, Moon Ram, do you have any tricks in assessing tonal values of the color laid down on paper? Um, I don't understand what she means, like to, to try to match it to something or she doesn't uh, specify to assessing tonal values. Um, not really. I, I'm not really understanding what you're asking, I guess. I mean, I, you know, sometimes if you squint, you can see what's darker and what's lighter. Even if the color's different, it helps you see the values a little bit more, if that's what you mean. So now that I've got that tree started, I'm going to tip it so the pigment wants to go to the bottom. Let's get it there so it's in frame a little bit better. I'm going right off the edge. And I am going to, I think I'm just going to, actually I'm going to spray it. I want to have a nice, uh, I want this to kind of morph down at the bottom. And I'm just going to sketch into the little tree next to it. I want it to be up a little bit higher because these are the closest ones to us, so they're going to span the entire page. I really just need to do this with water, but I want to see where I'm going and I want you to see where I'm going because I'm going to drip in some, uh, some colors here.
I'm just picking up from that puddle and using that water since it's already there. Okay, now I'm going to grab some of the purple, mixing it in with what I have there so that it doesn't get too crazy. I think that's very satisfying watching that paint flow. And that's really going to stand out because it's so different than anything we've used already. But it's very transparent, so you're going to see tones behind it as well. And I'm going to grab some of that indigo. And anytime, if you have some trees that didn't turn out so hot in that first layer that you did, it doesn't matter because you can you can paint uh, closer trees right over them and they're still going to add the atmosphere and they're still going to look fantastic even if it's not what you originally had hoped for when you first put them down there. Grab some of that transparent brown. When I first got these paints I actually put little dabs of color into these uh, wells here and um, and that worked out really well. It actually took me a long time to use up those colors. Uh, they, so it does seem like the Aquazol, I think, doesn't take up as much volume in the paint. So I think the paints go a lot further. I think you're getting a lot more pigment versus binder um, in those core paints. So that's another observation that I had about them because I just have the tiny five milliliter tubes and I have not even made a dent in them. Watching that purple spreads pretty relaxing. Isn't that fun? <sighs> I even got an extra cup of coffee this morning. Yeah, it's like listening to a cat purr. It is. Some crimson in there. I just love seeing those colors mingle. And that's one of those, those things with a nice quality paint and a nice quality paper that um, that even if, you know, even if you don't, you know, do much else to it, it just looks really pretty because you have that beautiful paper and beautiful paint. And I'm not saying that's a, you know, excuse not to learn how to paint, just, you know, just splash color around, but... It is very pretty to look at. Uh, Mary Shen, what do you think of the Mozart watercolor paints? Do you think they're similar to the Ganzai Tambi? Yes, they are quite a bit similar to them. Um, they're thick. Uh, I would be much more inclined. And they have two sets, actually. That's another thing to remind, to, to say. I didn't use the ones that are... Um, I use the ones that have like a Japanese name to them as well. They're not the ones, they have two sets. They have a regular kind of like watercolor, almost looks like a kid's uh, or a scholastic set. And then they have the, um, they have the ones that are Kumo something. They have a Japanese name. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, and those are the ones that I have never very much like Gansai Tanbei. They have some italics and neons. Um, and I have to admit, I haven't really... Uh, you played with them, them that much, except for in an art journal sitting on my porch one day. And uh, they were fun. Uh, they were vibrant. I like a paint that flows a little bit more than that. But um, but I would use them in like an art journal where I wouldn't want so much flow and spread because my paper wouldn't be able to handle it. I'm just deciding if I want to carry that dark all the way down. And I'm deciding whether I want to scrape with the end of a brush in there as well. So I think I'm going to. I think that will, that will look good. Uh, Moon Ram, what are the different ways to assess tonal values of the color? Example, a light blue could have the same values as a darker green. Um, well, you can adjust that by adding water. So, um, you know, there's a, each each paint, each color can get as light as you want it to be. Uh, I guess I'm still having a hard time understanding what... Do you Use mean, swatches? Like how... Look at a color wheel? I mean, that'll kind of you show could, yeah, you. Yeah, you could swatch stuff, definitely. Um, you know, maybe, I wonder if she means, like, trying to match. I'm, I think she means cool versus warm. I think is what she's trying to ask. Oh, like color temperature? Like cool, oh. like, because I'm reading val tonal value as cool versus warm. Oh, okay, I was thinking warm value, uh, meaning light versus dark. Um, well, when... That's something you kind of you kind of get after the more you paint. Kind of like, I think it's kind of like telling if a if a note is on key or not. It's like you can kind of hear if it's flat or sharp. Um, well, I, I have terrible pitch, but that that's kind of what I. <laughs> how do I describe it? You, you look for the bias in the color. I guess would, it would be my advice would be to look 
does this look like it's close? Does this blue look like it's closer to green? Does it look like it's closer to violet? And that would tell you um, what the uh, what the color temperature was. If that, I think that might be what she's asking. As far as light or dark, um, if you're working from a reference photo, you can always squint, and um, you know, and that that would tell you what color is dark and what's lighter. Because I know sometimes if you're looking at like a purple and a red and you can't tell what's darker because they're both so bright, squinty can help. Or you can take a quick picture with your cell phone and you can change it to black and white. And that can, you can see clearly what's darker and what's lighter. Could you give me a tissue, Lindsay? My yes. nose is getting a little... There you go. Uh, Axe LaRue. I have some old brushes that have a really loose ferrule. Is it okay to still use them? Yep. Well, what I do is I'll put a little, uh, like a waterproof glue in there, like an epoxy. And then I, um, I stick it right back on the handle. And sometimes I'll crimp it with pliers if that doesn't quite, uh, quite do the trick. I decided to add a few more trees in front. Now that one wasn't standing out enough. I need to add some purple to that or something to increase its, to darken its value. Because those two, even though they're kind of like, that's a green and that's a blue, the value is the same, so they don't stand out. The one in front is not standing out for me, so I need to do something that's going to increase the uh, value. So purple is a darker value. Uh, Tiffany Gray, how much pressure did you use when you made the trunks? Not much, because this paper's all wet. I'm going to encourage that to bleed a little bit. Yushishiko, what do you think about PBO Fine Watercolor? I've never used their watercolor. I have not heard great things about it, though, to be honest, but I've never used it. Which is odd because PBO usually makes some fantastic paint, but I, I, I heard their watercolor is not great. So I did not rush out to buy <laughs> to buy a set. Sometimes you know, well, I'll see about that. I'll see how good that is. <laughs> Now, if you wanted to, you could sprinkle some salt into this wash here for some interesting texture or maybe even a snowy look. If you do want to do scraping for the trunk, you need to do it while it's wet. There, I kind of I love the colors that are happening there. Just watch out for any puddles because I'll show you here. It's more prevalent in the wood pulp paper. Uh, if you have any puddles at all, you will get some blooming. And I did tape this down because I didn't want water to spill over into the other pages of my sketch pad. Uh, but this is a block, so I didn't bother taping because it is sealed on all sides. So I don't have to worry about that. Okay, so now I'm going to do something quite similar over here. Actually, I feel like I, I feel like that's really abrupt. So I'm actually going to put, just put a few little, little straggly bits there. Use a smaller brush just so that I don't go too crazy. This makes a really pretty black. This was like uh, just the the mush left over in my palette. Mush. That's a technical term. Yeah the sludge the drippings it's the, <laughs> the paint drippings <laughs> almost as good as gravy drippings oh, you're gonna get chewy all excited what drippings can quin azo gold be used in place of trans brown probably try if it, it if it does that if it has a real orange or yellowy uh undertone it should be fine I'm just going to paint a few clear, just clear water trees, just to kind of give it a transition to blend, to bleed into here. I think it's also fun, uh, especially if you're trying a new technique, to try different colors that maybe you don't often pick up, or maybe ones that came in a set that you were just like, hmm, I don't think that color is, is for me, that's not something I like to use. That's a great time to try it, because you might come up with something that's really unique and fun, and just the fact that, great way to get rid of uh artist block is just trying something new and it could just be a different color that you don't typically use mm -hmm. vegetable quiche 
That sounds good. I made Masaman curry the other night. Mm. I was very impressed with myself. Mm. I haven't been to a decent Thai restaurant in forever, so I was very excited yeah. to come up with a very passable version. And the 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 uh, restaurant, the uh, grocery store now sells these little mini packs of tofu. So it's like a regular thing of tofu, except it's divided. So you can only use you can use oh. half the tofu at once, which is really handy for you know if you're the only vegetarian in the house or the only tofu tofu eater. Eater, yeah. And it's the same price as the regular bulk of tofu. It's actually half an ounce more, and it's conveniently packaged. So when they figure wow, out the mistake, I'm unusual. sure it'll be. Yeah, I'm sure it'll jack be. it up. <laughs> they won't make that mistake again. I really like doing these little foreground trees just by painting them in water and, and dropping in a little paint. So I'm just gonna put a little bit in here now because I don't wanna. I want it to kind of stop. I want to stop the sprawl. Lost and found edges is such a fun, beautiful technique to, to play with. That's, I think, one of those techniques that really shows off the quality of watercolor really well. A little spritz here. I'm going to tip it on side there and spritz in the direction I want to flow. <laughs> Somebody's singing. I might be Maisie. Oh, yes. That sounds like Maisie. I have to say, this is more fun to paint on cotton paper than on uh, than on the wood paper. A lot of times it doesn't make a difference what you're using, but in this case it does seem to really affect the uh, the joy in the painting. And then over here I'm going to do a couple, a smaller cluster of trees, kind of bring it trouble over this into. way. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll start with that, uh, I'll start with a bright green, and I'm going to tip it again because I want a fat brush, but I don't want to have my hand in the way, so I'm just tipping it. Also, you might find that tipping your brush, uh, tipping your paper helps like keep the flow going down so that you end up with that mist, the, the misty bottoms of each of your, each of your tree groupings. I need more water in that. You don't want to cover up all of those, the cloudy areas though. You want to keep some of those very visible so you get those pockets of mist. Mary Shen, how do you choose paintings? Oh, hang on. We got a bunch of chat. Let me start over. Uh, Mary Shen, how do you choose pictures for the live paintings or a painting in general? Well, sometimes I have an idea of what I want to paint, but I just don't know uh, exactly how... I don't have a good idea in my head of what, like, say I want to paint a pomegranate and I want to paint a fig and I want to, like, make a still life, but I'm a little sketchy on... Like how exactly does a pomegranate look, or what is how how would the segments divided or of you know, the fruit? And so then I'll just I'll specifically look for reference photos for those particular subjects. Other times I am a little more blocked, and I'm thinking, okay, I don't know really what I want to paint. Um, maybe I'll look around and see if anything inspires me, and I'll go to one of my favorite um, websites that has royalty free. What, uh, photos, either a free one like Upsplash, or I'll go to Paint My Photo, um, or Pixels, or I'll go to a paid site like, um, well, it used to be Graphic Stock, now it's um, it's Storyblocks, and I'll and I'll look and see what I can find in there because a lot of times I can get really well good detailed photos, like I need a like a, a horse's head, or I need you know something very very specific, and then I can like really zoom in and see a detail of something. So there's, there's a couple instances. And then uh, a lot of times I take requests. So if somebody's asking for a particular flower, if it's something I've never heard of, you know, I'll just kind of look around for reference photos. So, um, you know, I just, I did. And then I also like on paint my photo, which I really like, that's a free site where, uh, photographers and artists share photographs. Um, you can organize things into, uh, into project folders into albums so I can I have like an album of oil painting ideas or acrylic painting ideas and that just kind of helps me like if I'm having a point where I've got a, a block uh, an artist block I can quickly go and say okay at one point this picture inspired me and you know and sometimes I have all kinds of everything is just inspiring to me I don't have any time to paint but everything I look at is just inspiring and then I'll just collect images at that point and then I'll come back to them those folders later so so I've kind of already curated myself a little a little uh, library 
that request the, the request page on my website really helps. Yeah, <laughs> I got yeah. a lot of really good ideas there. I wish I could do them all. There's there's a lot on there. Uh, Rolf de Kook. Sorry again, I'm probably saying it all wrong. Uh, what are the trade-offs between having fewer colors of paint and mixing the rest of the colors and having lots of different colors of paint and mixing less colors? Um, you should always mix. Uh, but you, but I don't always start with the same colors. Um, I rarely will use more than six colors in a painting. This is kind of rare for me to have six colors. Seven is probably the absolute most I will use in a painting. But I, uh, but I always mix because if you don't mix, if you just like you use like 20 different colors in a painting, you, that's, that's kind of the mark of an amateur, um, looking painting. I mean, and some people can use that many colors effectively. And I don't want to say that, you know, that no professionals do that because there are plenty of professionals that do. Um, but oftentimes the trade-off is that you lose the harmony in the work and um mud yeah you get you get mud because all those colors have been mixed for you in a lot of cases i mean not always there are a lot of pure pigment colors out there but you know the more colors been mixed the muddier it is so if you've if you're buying a color that's already been mixed with three pigments that's going to be less vibrant than any of those three, three pigments and you can't unmix them they're you know you are limited and a lot of craft paints have, you know, are, are not single pigments. They're, they're mixes of different things. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're very limited, much more limited. Mary shows, can you explain the concept of lost and found edges? Sure. And that's like when, um, when you've got like the tip of this tree here, it's nice and crisp. There it is. And then it fades away to nothing. And you might even like pick it up again somewhere else. So it's kind of like the technique where you let your mind fill in a lot of the gaps that, um, uh, that's in a painting. And you also have some nice crisp edges and you have some nice soft edges as well. Oh, sorry. I'm probably getting my hand right in your way. Let me switch to a smaller brush because I can now, because I've got the, the traveling paint down there already. Just keep your eyes out for blooms, especially in the edge of your paper. That's where they like to hang out and congregate. And since this is really wet, you can refine your edges. You can pull out some other branches and there, as long as your brush isn't wetter than your paper, the, the paint will go, will, uh, will want to leap onto the paper and kind of integrate into what you've got there. And so much of this is just, you just get used to it by practicing. I need a real dark value. So I've got that indigo in, in purple there so it can break away from what's in back. You can paint in some branches if you want. I mean, paint in some trunks. They're gonna fuzz away a little bit. Okay, I like that. I want those to kind of moosh together because that way there's, looks like some fog can be coming in, especially if you don't know exactly what's going on in that pic part of the picture. Maybe it's real dark from the photograph you have, or maybe you're going, you know, your picture is, is longer than the photograph that you're using. You know, if you're not sure what's happening there, that's a great place for a lost and found edge. You can just let it fade to nothing. A little bit more blue. I'll try some of this blue in there, but I think I need to mix it in with a little bit of that blue. I'm gonna blot my brush because I don't want to have too much moisture in there going into a wash that's starting to be established. But I can kind of flesh out the edge of a tree here because as the paper dries, the colors will move less. And the only way to learn how to balance out that is just practicing. I think we're just about done here. I can uh, dry it um, on like on screen if you guys want, so you can see how it looks completely dry. That might be helpful. So if you have any questions, I'm going to dry this in just a second, so you can see the final painting all dry. But I think that's pretty much all I need to do to that. I'm really happy with the way that came out. I like that pocket of fog in the center, but if you, if that's too bright for you, you can always. Um, you know, put in another tree and fade out the bottom of it. But I actually really like it. It looks like there could be like a little, a little waterfall in there, a pond or something where the water is just kind of evaporating up. 
or a wolf. Ooh, a wolf. <laughs> or a Sasquatch. A Sasquatch, some deer. The possibilities are endless. Put some owls or some birds or something if you want. I'll show you the uh, the two paintings side by side just so you can kind of get an idea of the texture of the paper and the. Um, you'll see more hard edges on the on the wood pulp paper, but I think they both look kind of pretty. Yeah, they're they're different, mm. but but I like them both. I like the. Well, we'll wait till you have both of them up because I can see both right now. Oh yeah, okay, <laughs> no, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna scrape in a few. <gasps> what? Branches. That is madness. I know. Oh, oh, someone suggested them. a log cabin. That would be an oh, idea, yep. too. Yep. Any questions while, uh... No, no, we're all, we're all caught up for the moment. Well, it's a mellow group today. It is. We have a lot of friendly chat. We have Good. a lot of our regulars are helping out with questions, so... And knock on wood, no technical difficulties. <laughs> well, we're at the end, so I don't really know... <laughs> I think I've figured out the new uh, YouTube thing, which actually is actually going to make things easier because you set it up once and now whenever I do a new live stream, I just pick that, those saved settings I've already set oh, up good, and good, everything, good. everything should, uh, should just work. Hopefully until I change it again, which, you know, probably be next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we're dry. A little damp there. Okay, so here is the finished painting that was done on the cotton paper. And again, this is Arches Cold Press, 140 pound paper. And this here is on the, I'm just gonna move that back because make sure it's in focus. This was done on Dale Arrowney Aquafine Cellulose Paper, which is just a, um, an inexpensive sketchbook that I have. Um, and I, like I said before, I taped it because I didn't want my, my water to seep over and like ruin the pages afterwards. I, uh, like underneath, I've done that way too many times. But you can see this is just a lot more susceptible to getting little blooms. That one's not, those aren't too strong because they're in such a light wash, but you can see them a lot more down here. And I mean, I watched out for puddles, but still, I mean, it's just kind of the tendency of this paper. Um, it, it has a hard time controlling a large amount of water, whereas the cotton paper is, it's much more absorbent. So it keeps an even tension of water on the paper. When you wet it, it wants to normalize and it wants to, uh, to be wet, you know, uniformly, kind of like a wet cloth would. So, um, so is there any other questions between the two? I'll show you that one again there. Uh, so. Ian Jackson, explain what you feel the difference in papers are to the painting. Um, a lot of times, like if you're painting fairly like wet on dry, um, I don't feel like there's a huge difference between cotton and wood pulp. Um, but when you get into situations where you need to do a lot of soaking and scraping and scrubbing, um, cotton paper is much more durable. It's like if you think of like having a, 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 a kitchen rag and um, you know you rinse it off and you wipe down your, your counters and you can rinse it off again and wipe down your counters, that rag is going to take rinsing and rinsing and washing and many, many times. But if you have a paper towel, even if you have a strong paper towel, you wipe down your counter, you rinse it out, it's gonna start to break apart. You might get a couple wipes out of it, but it's gonna disintegrate. And that's kind of the difference between cotton paper and cellulose paper. Um, sometimes cellulose papers will put a lot more sizing in it to help make it a little bit more durable. Um, of course, that makes your paint sit on top and slip around a lot more and encourages bubble, like a blooms and, and, uh, and back runs. So, um, Every paper is a little bit different, but you will notice a, a lot of similarities between brands of cellulose paper, which is wood pulp, and brands of cotton paper, which is obviously made from cotton. Um, so hopefully that describes it. Just think of a kitchen towel whenever you're confused. It's like, well, is that paper towel going to last if I wash it out and try wiping down my counters again, or is it going to fall apart? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's because it's paper. But a cotton towel will last and last. Over, over, over. Right, it's just over more durable. Again. All right, any other questions? 
all caught up. Okay, well, I want to thank you guys so much for um, <laughs> for coming back after last week's and the last two weeks of random technical difficulties. Um, and this replay will be available after the live stream. If you go to my blog, um, it'll be right there and it'll be up later tonight on YouTube. And uh, that is pretty much it. Please leave a thumbs up before you go. And if you're local, I'd love to see you at the Briar Patch Bookstore in downtown Bangor this afternoon from 4 to 6. And uh, you can get yourself a copy of this new book. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting!